The name Rastafari comes from His Majesty, Emperor Selassie. He was Rastafari before he was crowned Emperor Selassie. Emperor Selassie is his coronation name. We who saw him as a biblical fulfillment became known as Rastafari. We are his sons, and he's Rastafari, and we are Rastafari. Yeah, 52 nation went to his coronation. I said, then how can I know about it? He said, read your Bible. They that go in there shall weep in joy. There had always been a, a stream among the people of uh, memory. Uh, we had not completely forgotten Africa. And he that goes forth weeping burn present seed. If there is anything we contribute to Jamaica society, one of the major thing is wisdom to get them wise. Get a society wise. Know that you're black, know that you're African, know that you're suffering by colonialism or neo-colonialism or whatever. Bring in the sheets with him. 144,000 elected saints. Black women and children numberless at the sun of the seashore. Crying out, Sila! Sila, Sia, Icha! Rastafari! Born in 1887, Marcus Garvey is considered the greatest prophet amongst Rastafarians. In 1916, he emigrated to the United States. There, he established a chapter of his Universal Negro Improvement Association an organization which set about restoring pride and dignity amongst Africans and people of African descent. His Pan-Africanist philosophies have been the springboard from which most black nationalist and African independence leaders have based their struggles. His mantra being, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. Marcus Garvey tradition was, was kept um, in the years following the, the, the waning of the UNIA was kept alive by Rastas. Well, Rastafara is the unity and love of black people, you know. That is the first meaning of Rastafara. Unity and love of black people get together, self-awareness, self-reliance. You don't depend on the next nation to do nothing for you. You have to depend on your own. You know, Marcus Garvey speak of it. Self-awareness, self-reliance, self-confidence. Marcus Garvey had told us that we were to look to Ethiopia and when a king is crowned, then we know that our deliverance would be at hand. Now that the king was crowned in 1930, followers of Garvey saw this as a fulfillment. And there the movement was formed. Marcus Garvey didn't actually in any speech prophesy about the rise of an African king. But he did write a play, he performed the play, entitled The Crowning of the King and Queen of Africa. The closing scene was a coronation, and those words, look to Africa when the king and queen is crowned, to know that your hour of redemption is at hand, uh, must have occurred in that, in that play. So when the actual coronation of Selassie took place, um, and his empress Menem, the um, uh, Howell, and a, lot of, a number of people, independently of each other, began to attach significance to that because of what Garvey has said. Leonard Howell was a follower of Marcus Garvey and a member of the UNIA. Charismatic and outspoken, he criticized the colonial interpretation of the Bible and in 1934 began to spread his belief that Christ had returned to earth as a black man. Leonard Howell is the forerunner for Rastafari because he's the first one that come and say Rastafari is God.
this is the site of the great house where Leonard Howell once lived. He had pur purchased this property in 1934. 300 acres. The inhabitants there were all Rastafarians. About 1,800 of them. And this is the top. Overlooking two or three parishes in Jamaica. You have uh, Clarendon, St. Catherine, and you can see as far as Kingston. So this view covers three parishes of the 14 parishes in Jamaica. A very beautiful scene. When I come to Pinnacle in 1940, and that day when I came was the 60th of February, 1940. Mm -hmm. 1940, we come to Pinnacle, the 60th of February. And the, the bookman checked that day, it was 1,798 and people never finished coming there. Him happy feed the whole and people there. They were a community of followers settling, and each had his or her own plot of land in which you cultivated and so on and sold the crops and so on. They raised goats, they raised cash crops and so forth. But Howell made a point of using ganja as a cash crop, which used to be sold in the marketplace in Kingston. It was at the time, although it was proscribed from 1925, it was never really prosecuted so that it was possible to find ganja op sold openly. So, me see right now, if you go and free ganja, better free. I cook you want to fight, you know? And free ganja. In this part of the community, I'd help you build house and everything and buy one of these. Just the weed, you know? And the yam and thing. I just, I just didn't really live off a moist. Just the weed, me depend on. Howell amassed a considerable fortune from ganja, and the Rastas became inextricably linked with its cultivation. The early followers grew beards to emulate Haley Selassie and regarded Howell as a prophet. When you see him, you have to stand up, take off your cap, and bow to him, and a black man, you know. And it's a black man, a rise and shine for the light has come. They used to sing songs to him, just as I always sing a song yeah. To Jesus Christ, you know, they sang songs about how it, you know. One thing was gang. They were hearing Caleb gang. It was gang, Gunguru Maraj. He miscounselor. He miscounselor the hero. There's a Rastafari. You see, one man. When how it come here, he come and we cut off to those things. And when he told us about Rastafari and we check history, we say the return Messiah. For Christ means Savior. So Rastafari is our Savior. Rastas used to be stoned on the streets. Um, they were considered, uh, you know, derelicts and outcasts and so forth at one time, and madmen. You know, mad. The imperial government didn't want you to say Rastafari is God or to show the people the truth. Because they must show you a false God and you are show the right God. So he oppress you and persecute you for it. You understand? He said that you is mad man. He never seen tabas. Them come all up there. Then do all kind of things to him that is wicked. We have a house up there when we rent, seven room furnished. And all the members and kings and all about come there. And we said them plan, then government plan to come in and do damage. And tear them and march and beat the people them. And in leave seven room furnished. And in leave St. Thomas with one tooth pan him back. And he don't return back there yet. So you see everything happy Ben and everything happy country. You hear me say? So I was living in Kingston and he lived and to St. Thomas and rent a house. Seven room furnished, may I tell you. Seven room. 
አማን ላይ ለተኒ ማሰብ ዙም ሆነ ጨመታ ታና ወካና ሆስ አና ካንዲ ካና ማን አለን ኮም ዳነ ማሽክ ሰዲ ጎበመን ሰ እፈን ካምብሪን ሆ ዊል ላይ ብን ይሄድ ከፈራና ቴን ብሎድ ፍጂ ቶ ብሎድ ሮን ዩሲድ የነቲን ኬስ ወለንዱ ሂም ፈን ካምፒ ፍጂ Howell was pursued by the colonial government who believed this castigation of whites and message of a black Christ would destabilize the colonies. He was denounced by the authorities and imprisoned several times, spending many years committed to Bellevue Mental Asylum. Howell at the trial spoke in tongues and behaved as a religious person who who is inspired would possibly be behave um, in a manner that made them feel that he was mad. For example, he went silent after a while. You ask him questions, he could never penetrate that silence. is not a man like you, you know. Still a man. He said, not a man like easy to know. I mean, it's even this approach here, thank you. What's the kind of man? A funny man. It's been a history whereby the state uses dementia as a way of uh, delegitimating um, you know, certain religious figures and, and um, slandering them and so on. The fact is that if you believe in a God, that's madness because you can't touch and feel God. So it, there is a, there's a touch of madness in everybody for that matter. And it's only a matter of, um, uh, you know, society's definitions and, and, and measures that you can say somebody is completely mad. Rastafari! After years of discrimination, communities have separated from mainstream society. They have established communes where they continue to preach the back to Africa philosophies of Marcus Garvey and adhere to strict religious practices. They are not permitted to eat meat, drink alcohol, or smoke cigarettes. chief person, blessed trinity, prophet, priest, and king. Give thanks for the royal prophet who come in the darker days and say, up your mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. Read for the stars of equality and justice. Equality and justice stand for one. Equality and justice stand for all. Those and they that love Satan's kingdom will have to fall for our father. Marcus I Set deep in the hills of St. Thomas, this is Bath, a place of spiritual healing for the Rastas. They believe that a slave was once beaten by his master and visited these hot springs, where the wounds to his back were miraculously healed. The waters are said to possess great healing powers. Remember, Jack, that's all I have to do. Here's the place 
The old man in this country and trim and shave you for your beard. I've been on your beard. If you go to get a work and I find your beard, they tell you must go and trim and come back. In those days, the few people that you see have on beard, they call them Donna Michi or Clark Gables. But not until Rastafari came into existence and we saw the beard, man started to use beard. So that is how we, the beard started to come. And then they started to call you Rastafari. In the mid 50s, locks come about. For their, it, when they was fighting in Kenya to get independent, the other set of people named the Mama, they didn't send them here because they're fighting a war. But they bring a show in Jamaica named something of value. They show us two generals, General China and General Komati. In the 1950s, uh, late 40s, there was a group um, called the Youth Black Faith. They developed a, a sense of aggression, aided and abetted in a way by the contemporary struggles of the Kenyan people, pictures of whom appeared in, as a dreadlocks, people you know, wearing the, na the matted hair. Also, one of, um, I was my, one of my informants who was critical in this whole development told me that um, they, they took on to themselves that outcast, um, derelict, uh, image precisely to offend the society. In other words, you call, you, you call us outcasts? Well, we are indeed outcasts. We are not a part of you because our society is Africa. We become extremists. We extreme. My parents didn't like it in the first. Them did, some of them, some of my parents, um, call me troublemaker, making trouble. You want police come here and want police come do with this and want police come do with that. But we don't care, you know. It is a dreadlocks more than anything else that signals a transformation. It's, the, it's that part of you which you can easily change. You, um, you can change your your self-concepts, you can change your religion, you can change your identity and so on, nobody would know that. But once you wear that locks, you signal that kind of change. To be wearing visibly hair that is considered bad, hard to manage, and which is a mark of an inferior person then. And appropriating that and glorying in, the, in that Dreadlocks gradually became a visible symbol of militancy. And in 1960, the movement captured international headlines when Reverend Claudius Henry, a Rasta initiate, and 38 of his followers were arrested in an alleged plot to overthrow the government. A letter addressed to Castro was found, urging him to invade Jamaica and promising assistance from the group. Fearing an invasion from Cuba, the colonial government instituted naval patrols and went as far as requesting assistance from the United States. A man by the name of Reverend Henry was in America and he come to Jamaica and started to preach Rasta doctrine. He was training some youth with some gun. Well, the colonial government never liked it. So they eventually charged him with subversive activity. Claudius Henry didn't come as you no know, saviour to save the Rasta. He come no pretending same his member of the Ethiopian World Federation. And him farm a thing named Seventy Manuel Brethren and take out member of the Ethiopian World Federation to join it. They want to overthrow the government, but they might involve Rasta, say Rasta, they don't Rasta on a politic. And... Then his son, Reverend Henry, and six more other brethren come from America with guns. 
said them come to take out them father out of prison. Well, they ambush some Hampshire soldier, that is a British man soldier, white man, and kill two and wounded one and make them escape. So the soldier then report to Mr. Manley, Norman Manley, that is Rasta, kill them and them. So Mr. Manley say to the nation over the radio, anywhere you see two or three Rasta together, report to the nearest police station. Well, better plan up with me and Sam Brown, right Sarata Lewis at the University at the West Indies. Tell him to come and investigate the Rasta movement to prove that the movement is not subvertive. So Sir Arthur Lewis sent Rex Nickleford, Ajay, and Smith come and investigate the movement. After they find out the truth of Rasta, they write a book showing that Rastafari are non-subvertive. We are Christian. We say Rastafari is God and we want to go back to Africa. So they recommend Mr. Manley to receive a 10-man delegation from the Rasta movement to send to Africa. We went to Ethiopia, Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. In Nigeria, Dr. Para told us that he's glad to see that we forgive them, that we want to come back to Nigeria knowing that the stronger tribe did sold some of our four parents into slavery. And land is there for us. He wants us to come. In Ethiopia, the emperor said, people of the West, that is of African descent, as long as you're black, and in the African descent, we are entitled to come. The land is there for them. The mission to Africa and the subsequent report by the University of the West Indies on the activities of the Rastafarians allayed some of the government's fears. However, worse was yet to come for the Rastas. In 1963, there was an incident take place in Carroll Garden, Mobile, with the Rastaman and the people. It was said that six Rastaman killed a man and burned down a gas station. The police force come in and kill three of the Rastaman, lock up two, and one was at large. And they take 300 Rastaman in jail, put them in jail. And Sir Alexander Bustamante says, if the jail cannot hold them, show them and Bogil. Bogil is a symmetry in Mobile. So that means is to kill them. They start get a Rasta man, they start get a any man we have on beard. The Prime Minister said they must bring us in dead or alive. Anywhere the Rasta man there, the policeman go for him, you know. From St. James to St. Elizabeth, straight on to, to, to St. Anne. Every jail packed with Rasta man. Because remember them say carry them in dead or alive, so holy dead they out there too. The leader of the country is carrying Rasta dead or alive. So then go all down and take grass back to my railway lane down at the slaughterhouse. Yes. When they kill Melbourne out there. Yes. See them that time? Rasta shave off their head clean. And me know them, they went jaggy and hang down. Because I tell you, see a long time in know Rasta. They used to cut. Rastafarians locks for nothing at all. So Rastafarians had to go down the gullies sometime in order to transport himself from point A to point B. If you walk on the streets, people would terrorize you also and call for the policeman and say, there goes a black heart man. And the police would come down on you for nothing at all. My opinion said the government right. You ask me a question, me give you an answer. 
The constant persecution of the Rastas elevated the movement's status amongst the people, who were becoming despondent with the government. It happened that the young people um, became, uh, caught the vision of Rastafari, and they did at the time because the, there, was a, uh, there were a lot of answers, the questions that the society couldn't answer. Um, the slow movement of an economy, the independence, but you don't feel in the independence. Um, independence was in 62, but um, from what were we independent? You know, and you couldn't feel anything. And uh, the, the Rastas began to articulate, not began, but they, they, they had been articulating this. In 1966, Emperor Haile Selassie visited Jamaica. This gave the Rastafarians much needed credibility. And for the first time, Rastas were rubbing shoulders with the middle classes and ruling elite. Galvanized by the Rastas' enthusiasm for the emperor, public gathered to see the man the Rastas revered as God. Emperor Haile Selassie's visit was amazing in that he was the only official uh, head of state to come to Jamaica and had such a large, large gathering. People went over the uh, stairs, came downstairs and was around the, the foot of the plane, smoking herbs, you know, lighting up pipe. Police ran all over the place, soldiers, protocol was completely broken down. It was thousands, thousands of people came to that, the airport in those days, that day. Emperor Haile Selassie had to call for Martimer Planner to take him from the plane steps because of the large crowd that gathered around the steps. But the official spoke over a microphone he said, call him out to my planner, call him out to my planner. He came over in seconds and was right at the plane steps with his majesty. We met him at King's House and he said to us, how long does the Rastafari movement start in Jamaica? We said to him, ever since your coronation, your majesty, the 2nd of November, 1930, he said to us, your work are purposeful. We must continue in our endeavor that we may not stop the Rasta. Right? Him say, but here when God say no, you must centralize and organize. The Emperor's endorsement reduced tensions and gave weight to the political demands of the movement. The visit of Selassie confirmed Rastafari beliefs for many people. Many people were you know, you know, convicted in Rasta from that day. The first house really had no particular leader. Away from Hoyle, who was the original leader. But after a while, men broke away from other houses, maybe because of location and things like that. A man will farm a house, give it a name. And in addition to that, by building up doctrines of their own, they might find little differences from house to house or between houses and houses. In the beginning, all camp that be as from Rastafari. It's after a while now, man start to call him camp different name. Some call it Naya Bingi. Some call it 12 tribe, some call it Ethiopian World Federation. Then the movement moved to the four corner of the island. East, north, south and west. Man saying Rasta. In the history of Jamaican folk religions, um, and this is one of the reasons why you know that Rasta is a folk religion, um, the centers of organization, you know, are anywhere, anytime, any place, you know, so they spring up all over. As the Rasta doctrine spread throughout the island, a renewed sense of pride in Africa took hold. It was only a matter of time before Pan-Africanist demands began to be articulated. 
Rastafari really wants repatriation. We don't want migration. We didn't spend any money to come to the West. So most naturally, we shouldn't be responsible for going back to Africa, where money is concerned. The Jews got reparations, and we should have gotten it also. Who want to go back to Africa? A part of the reparations can take us there. Who want to stay home? A part of the reparations can rehabilitate them who want to stay here. So we really need repatriation to go back to our own country to rebuild Africa. Them have to pour on the land here in a slavery man and work for nothing man. Time come for them pay we part for them nation rich. England have any rubber tree? Tell me. But look how much rubber in England have. Eh? Where you get it from? Africa. They want to eat. We can go Africa go reap one of thing. Them go Africa and take away all of the things and carry enough for them man and make themselves rich. Jamaica is just a dot on the map, a open prison, as you can see, surrounded by water. We build up the rest already, what more they want from us. Send us back up now, build back our land. Drumming is really a part of the African culture. In Africa, the Africans use drums for various reasons. Even to send messages as a form of communication, to entertain themselves, rituals and dances. So we brought that with us here in the West. There is some form of spirituality in the beating of the drums. The sound goes down into the earth, it travels to the fire key, and the fire key ascends the fire and smokes into the atmosphere, which makes contact with the Almighty and with the energies of the world. Early developments of the of the, the music, uh, Rastafari artists were influential, expressing that deep desire, desire for Africa, critique against the society. When the young people came in it, they brought with it, into it, their own, their own lifestyle and their own um, passions and so on. And that's how the music became associated with the Rastafari, because uh, these were young musicians, you know, who 
caught the vision of Rastafari, young artists, and used, the, uh, incorporated that vision in their art. By the every, every artist, every aspiring artist, wanted to be a dreadlocks and had, as it were, to dread as a garb of distinction, you know. Not until Bob Marley now become a Rasta and use reggae music as a vehicle to spread the word of Rasta internationally, that Rasta became international. <laughs> I was the one who cultured Rita Marley, Bonnie Whalers, Peter Touch, when he was when Bob was in Delaware. When Bob came back from Delaware, they bring Bob to me. And he got a bit of the culture also. When I first introduced Bob to Mortimer Planner, the first thing that Mortimer tried to do was to get him to be independent in the music fraternity. So as not to depend on the producers who would exploit entertainers in those days. Bob wanted to do him one business. If I want to leave Coxton, if I meet David Coxton, but him never get justice according to him. So if him not come, well, we can't help him, you know, do him one business. But me couldn't do no business with him. Me did have my business at home. He's a man who is a ganja man. Me that deal with my ganja business. Me not have no time for him. Me not have no time for music and things like that. And me did prejudice bad, 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 bad. She like how you no rest me no talk to you and all them kind of things. And you know, prejudice. Me tell him some no Yel Selassie, meet Yel Selassie, me go to Africa and meet Yel Selassie. When he comes here, every Rasta man has said Yel Selassie is God. So he can come meet a man who meet Yel Selassie now. So he find it appetizing to so sit down and talk to me who talk to God. After being at Marty, Marty assisted in cutting some music for him, you know, music like Chances Are and uh, High Silas is the Chapel and uh, music like those. As a matter of fact, Marty has a little hand in almost all of Bob's songs while he was with him because he used to put in a line here and there, you know, and things like that. He really assisted him and strengthened him in the makeup of his lyrics. Bob got shot at one of them rehearsal and leave and go to England, exile like. Rita get shot in her head and him get shot in them elbow. You know, him sing a tune, him. You're running and you're running and you're running away. You can't run away from yourself. You're running away. You're running away. You're running away. April now. Him going come from England. For him to go away to England after him get shot and things like that. Hey. Bob now tell Manly say. Him want to do something for Jamaica, but him no want no politics attached to it. So him go do a concert, peace concert. Them work to them for do. So me say me that like you call Monday and bust and um Siago and show them. Tell them for at them cause the division between people with this political party business. We get people and them want to get them united and things. You say me can't do that. I said, what? He said, I can't do that. At the peace concert, Martin Mohamed Planner was trying to get Bob Marley to get the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition to shake hands. When he told Bob, Bob said, 
Our boss, are you for that, you know? It's like he, he didn't think he could manage it. And three consecutive times, he told Bob to do it. I'm vexed, Bob, vexed. And you know, when Bob time come for profile, him come out. First thing, him make a dumb sign, sing a dumb tune. Say, you two send them come, shout me. It's a dumb tune, no, no words, but he must demonstrate it. Say, you two, which is Manly and Siago, send gunman, come shoot him. You understand? And anyhow, I'm sad. Broke out a sing jamming, you jamming? You jamming, you jamming, you jamming. And I'm a dance thing. The balance is it. The political undercurrents of Bob Marley's music established the Rastafarians as a voice of the oppressed. With no party allegiance and contemptuous of Jamaica's two-party system, the Rastas are vocal critiques of the corruptions and failings of both parties. I think the system purposely and intentionally tried to keep some of us poor. And we, the Rastafarians, have cited that. All the hullabula about poverty and trying to eradicate poverty, that's only a mask. I really don't want to eradicate poverty. If you are poor, you have to go through extreme fight to get out of it and to eat a, a decent food. If you just sit there and lay back, you'll always be poor and the servants of these people. I think the politicians use the people in the ghetto to gain political mileage. You have two parties and the people that is educated cannot be used. That's why education is very important. They will probably look on politics as it is. But in the ghetto, you don't have a chance to make a choice for yourself. If you are in a PNP area, you have to say PNP. You have to defend your turf and terrain. If you're in a labor right area, you have to say labor to make a labor party. So politics divide the people. You have good people on both sides in politics. Even the dons of the PNP and the dons of the Labour Party. They are good to their people that is under them or around them or surrounds them. But when it comes to the opposing party, there's always a crossfire. So I'd say politics divide the people in Jamaica. And good people too. People that could be good to the poor, there's a split. So you have good people fighting against good people in defense of a political party. And if a party is going to give you a thing or two, with a cash or a kind, being a poor man, you'll be tempted to, or attracted, to get something. And then again, it's not all the poor people gets attention either. You know, it's only the diehards, those who gather around their ministers from day to day and from time to time and from campaign to campaign. These are the people that get benefits. But if they don't see your face, no benefits. Guns are used 
to fight against each other politically. And as far as public opinion is concerned, we have got to find out that these same very guns were given to the ghetto youths by the politicians. We live in a area where Yeah, man. Heard of a prevail with peace. And a Rasta have to do that. We don't vote pan just where we see, I take peace. see and oh, you would I take a MP. We vote as garden to the area where you live. But them have them way of them deal with it. Them leave it pan we for a while. Like divide us so much. Have you participated in any of this yourself? Well, I'm on there and things happen at times, yes. I'm on take part because at times me represent a member group and we politically so and move around and see what go on within the inside part of And band come see my mother PMP and my father PMP. Them vote for PMP. So we ban and grow come see this thing here. Yeah. And we make sure we deal with the positive part of it. As you can hear in the background that is shot where you have adult man, we don't have no control upon that unless you have to directly go out there and deal with a man and say, don't do this or don't do that. So cut why it, is it? Cut it. Man, yeah. Mm. So, Bigger, you were saying about the gun shop? Mm. Yeah, guy. I try to talk, you can hear two rings. So you can know how to get a run. We're bad man, not do know. Eh? We not play when it come on to the woman then. Cause you have some boy I go the wrong way and I look on the men then. So listen. Me love the way the girl my go on when me see them a perform certain things where them a fan make me need them. Rock foot, we are request every girl with stick burst and it's happy manifest because me need them. Well, if a girl me Spanish fly, try to tell them be a lie just to get a little fly because me need them. Well, me have to confess, woman really got blessed and does the thing with them possess. Yo! Woman me scrutinize because me find them personable. And then me hypnotize and take them from a higher level. Hope them don't decide them know me unconquerable. Now go ease up when me know me sitting level. Female me check for some me have them in a quantity. Love the gal them bad, some me kill them with fidelity. Me and me gal them load me chalice, burn it down to the gritty. Love the gal them bad, me not quit it. So what? Uh, Under one of vice, is it nice? So listen. There has always been a kind of anarchic revolutionary stream that flows through the popular music. That's 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 part of it. It's it's um, uh, the music is a is a medium for relating to society. It's so whether here or in Trinidad, um, and that is in it. That is the tradition. These artists really try to sing and speak about their surroundings. What are they, whatever they see in their surroundings, that's what they write in their lyrics. So it might appear at times that a DJ might be negative, 
what he's really speaking about, the only thing he knows. Reggae music has bridged the gap between the Rastas and mainstream society. They are now tolerated as part of the cultural makeup of Jamaica. However, deep prejudices still exist throughout the Caribbean towards those who choose to wear their hair in dreadlocks. Many are stereotyped as criminals, vagrants and drug dealers. It is a constant battle for the Rastas, who have always distanced themselves from those who appropriate the dreadlocks without embracing the disciplines. You have people wearing locks who are not Rasta, but they just love the look of the locks. You call them fashion dreads. They wear the locks because it looks good. They didn't wear it because of the concept of Rastafari. So they will be mistaken for a Rastafarian, but you really know a Rastafarian because of what he says or what he delivers. Today, sometimes you see a Rasta man, he don't bother study you because we get so enough now that it don't trouble a man again. You understand? He don't feel no way. Because everywhere you go from the corner, you see a Rasta. Most movements, you don't have to fight against it. And it dwindles. But this movement, mother fight against it, father fight against it, sister fight against it, brother, teacher, nurse, pastor, everybody, the whole system fight against it. And instead of it dwindles, it spreads globally. Peoples of different ethnicities, and of different nationalities and races can appropriate um, central messages uh, of Rastafari. <clears throat> what this will mean, in fact, is that there'll be uh, an international movement or Rastafari movement, you know. If you go to Japan, you'll find Rastafarians. If you go to Europe, you'll find Rastafarians. If you go to America, you'll find Rastafarians. And if you go to Africa, you have Rastafarians. And it really started from up here in Pinnacle, you had about 1,800 people to 2,000 people. And now I think you have a fair amount of people saying Rastafari in the world. Rastas and reggae music have generated much needed foreign currency for Jamaica. Their association with the island has helped establish Jamaica as one of the Caribbean's top tourist locations. The government is happy to exploit the iconic imagery of Rasta, yet refuses to officially recognize the movement. There is a, another change that is taking place locally um, in Jamaica, which is of great significance. The Rastas have, been, have begun uh, a kind of uh, a transition into uh, a greater sense of a, being a religious community. Uh, they are elaborating more rituals. They are, um, they are uh, you know, writing their own songs. The earlier songs of Rastas were revival songs with new words, you know new wine in old bottles, if you will. Um, now they're putting together their own songs. They have tabernacles, and they've appointed high priests, you know, and so forth. Britain and in some of the states in the United States, a Rastafari can claim religious status, which therefore frees them from, from discrimination and so on. Right here, Rasta has not yet even been formally recognized as a religion. 
it is not the the rosters of twice I believe in their uh, the last 30 years um, appeal to Parliament for incorporation status and they have not have been denied yet a, yet a, a church like the Latter-day Saints which until recently used to believe that black people could not share the same heaven as white people has been um, granted uh, has been incorporated here well Rastas don't have that they have been denied that twice so, uh, of The society will, in fact, come to grips with Rasta in the full sense. I think it's a matter of time before the, the um, parliament grants it um, status, incorporated status, so that Rasta can be settled, you know, in as a part of the religious landscape. Anyway, you're going to the world to see a Rasta. All white men become Rasta now, too. Go to Europe, you see no Rasta. And this Rasta carried the doctrine all about. I am one of the first men that travel the world preaching Rasta doctrine. Rastafari message of peace and love is just natural. Because even if you go biblical, the Bible speaks of love and it speaks of, speaks of peace. And there is nothing better than peace. And the Rasta man has realized that and is trying to get across to the people to show them that it's better for us to live in love and unity and peace and harmony than fighting against each other. Me still a Rasta, and me not stop. You can't take Rasta out of me. You can't take me out of Rasta. So you, if you try, still you can't try no more. I'm just Rasta for I. A lot of Still a Rasta, and me not stop. You can't take Rasta out of me. You can't take me out of Rasta.